wearables are an area that's starting to have power, but even the medical establishment is still fairly resistant to wearables, I would argue. But but they are gaining attraction. Uh, they started out as fitness trackers. And, and the way we got involved is when they started out as fitness trackers, Apple Watch didn't exist. We said, well, gosh, these are pretty good you know, physiological monitors. They're measuring, as you say, heart rate, skin temperature, uh, more limited number of things at that time. Now they'll measure all kinds of things, heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration, even your blood oxygen, even though it's not accurate, it measures your changes pretty good, and blood pressure. Yeah, all kinds of different things you can get from a smartwatch and and many of those same things from a ring, the Aura ring, for example. So uh, they're very, very powerful. And, and if you think about it, they're measuring you 24-7 and they're taking hundreds of thousands of measurements every day. Some of them will measure, make millions of measurements every day. And so they're really getting a detailed view of your physiology. And we think that's super powerful. And so what we discovered uh, early on, we put these on on folks. And once again, that's probably the second most important thing I learned from monitoring myself was when I got Lyme disease. I figured it out from a smartwatch and something called a pulse ox that measures your blood oxygen. And and the story there, if you'd like to hear it, was I was, um, uh, you can tell I measure everything on me. I'm wearing four smartwatches right now. You can see, and I normally have a ring, but I lost it. Um, and glucose monitors the whole shebang. So anyway, with these um, um, smartwatches, uh, or sorry, with the Lyme disease, I was helping my brother put up fences in rural Massachusetts. And then two weeks later was flying to Norway through Frankfurt, actually. And on this last flight, uh, I measure myself as you know, uh, I always wear uh, pulse ox because it turns out your blood oxygen drops on airline flights. Most people don't know that. Most pilots do. Most flight attendants don't. But anyway, your your blood oxygen does drop. It's not well documented how much it drops. We've now documented all that. But it was pretty clear to me when I flew from Frankfurt to Norway, my blood oxygen dropped abnormally low. It dropped to 90 when it would normally drop on that kind of a plane to 96, and it never came back to normal. And I saw my heart rate was running high. Uh, and then when, yeah, same thing, it stayed high. And then I later learned my skin temperature was up too, all measured from my smartwatch. And then uh, I had no symptoms at that point, but a, a day later I started getting some mild symptoms. And they didn't go away. So I went to a doctor in Norway. I warned him it might be Lyme because of the timing, this two weeks. And he drew blood, saw my immune cells called monocytes were up, said, yep, we've got a bacterial infection. He recommended I take penicillin. I said, no, I need doxycycline, which is what you use for Lyme. It's a little tense for the <laughs> moment there because, you know, doctors don't like their patients telling them what to do. And, and he was no exception, that's for sure. Uh, he did give in because I was about to go about the Arctic Circle and I did not want to be sick. Uh, and he gave it in. It cleared it up right away. You do take it for two weeks. And when I got back, I got tested. And sure enough, I was lying positive by, by antibodies. They even some, had some antigens, some, some proteins from the Lyme that were still there. And it's well-controlled experiment because I had given blood three days before I left. And sure enough, my, uh, I was negative. So I sure converted during that time. So the, the key part of that story is I actually figured out when I was first getting sick from my smartwatch and a pulse ox, uh, and it was how I detected my line before symptoms. So with that, um, we realized that these are really powerful devices for measuring when you get ill. And so I had two years of data at that point on my smartwatch. And so we went uh, and looked over all the data, and it turns out I was ill four times during that period. One was a line case. Uh, two times were a viral infection, and the fourth time I was asymptomatic, but I know I was sick because there's a protein called C-reactive protein that was elevated, and it was just as high as my viral infections in Lyme. So there were four times I was ill, and we looked at the data, and every single time my resting heart rate and my skin temperature was up, and was uh, up before the symptoms appeared. So we wrote an algorithm. It works for heart rate. doesn't work for skin temperature. We wrote an algorithm that follows your baseline and looks for a jump up in your heart rate, uh, resting heart rate, I should emphasize. And, and it worked. Every, uh, uh, so retrospectively, we could show every single time I got ill, my heart rate jumped up early and it was an advance of symptoms. It worked on me and it worked on three other people who also were ill and were wearing the same smartwatch. One of them got sick twice. Every single time, we could see the jump up in heart rate before symptoms. 
So that was uh, sh that really showed that these are incredible health monitors, and these weren't expensive devices. These are like, especially at that time, I think it was like something like a hundred and fifty dollar watch that was was doing all this. And I, I know you can do it for a hundred dollar watch. So as you as you might imagine, then when COVID came along, we just we had been building out, improving our algorithms, building an infrastructure to do this at scale. I'll come back to what that means in a minute. But what we can do now is, and when COVID came along, we quickly enrolled, uh, opened up the study, partnered with Fitbit, Garmin, uh, and launched a study to try and first show if we could detect COVID with a smartwatch. And then the second part, which we're in now, is alerting people if, they, if their heart rate goes up. Uh, and, and so what we're doing for the first part, we showed that with, um, with a smartwatch, we can see people's resting heart rate jump up. Uh, we had 32 people wearing a Fitbit at the same time um, they were had COVID and they had a diagnosis date and a symptom date. And we showed that for 26 of the 32, we could detect the jump up in resting heart rate. And in basically in nearly all cases, it was at or before symptoms. So 81% of the time, we can see people's resting heart rate jump up with COVID. Uh, and then we have now, and, and it turns out, by the way, the, the very first case we had, it was 10 days early. Somebody, you, it was a very clear signal. You can see this person's heart rate jump up 10 days early. Uh, on average, though, it's about four days. So people's heart rate will jump up four days before their symptoms if they have COVID, it turns out, and that we can pick up with a smartwatch. So uh, we're now, uh, we've written some algorithms to do this in real time comes back to what I was telling you before. So you follow your baseline and you look for, for this elevation and resting heart rate. We have three different algorithms to do this. And so we'll profile you. I don't know if you've signed up for the study yet, Rhonda. I hope you have. <laughs> so anyway, it, it builds an hour by hour measurement of you. And when you jump up, you know, pretty high for an extended period, say six these days to keep the false positive, it's more like 12 or 24 hours. If you're up for a while uh, and you're, it's statistically, you know, unlikely, it's not a random fluctuation, it's up there, uh, we send an alert. And it turns out it works, it works pretty well. So 70% of the time, we can detect illness. We had 63 people as of the end of January who had COVID, and 44 of them we could detect in real time and alert them before at the time of symptoms. So it's not perfect. It needs a lot of tuning still. And that's why we want people to enroll in our study. We want to basically improve the algorithms. And we don't yet, it, it, uh, it's not just specific for COVID. Other illnesses will trigger it. And also other things will trigger it, like uh, too much alcohol, not a drink or two. But if you really tie one on, you'll <laughs> send your heart rate up. Uh, hiking in the mountains will do it too. So, so you have to contextualize it. But it does work in general for detecting respiratory illnesses. And so with, with improvement in algorithms, I want to be able to tell the difference between you know, drinking too much versus a respiratory viral infection. I don't yet know if we'll tell the difference between flu and COVID. We'll have to see. Where can people go to sign up for this COVID tracking study with their wearables? Yeah, go to innovations with an S on the end dot Stanford dot edu slash wearables. So innovations dot Stanford uh, dot edu slash wearables. And we'd love to have you enroll and, and it does work. 